Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is um, Bridget Jones. I'm Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Children's Mercy and I am co-PI of Spectre who's um, supporting and funding and putting on this webinar um, today. So we're excited today to have a um, excellent panel discussion um, with four excellent panelists. So today we'll be hearing about the real world experiences of underrepresented in medicine and science um, members on sponsorship and mentorship. And so we're hoping that this will be a, an open discussion among the panelists, but also we hope to have engagement um, from um, the audience as well. So we will have the chat open if you want to put questions and comments in the chat as we go along, um, please do so. We will have a little bit of time at the end um, for questions, but we would like to engage with you all um, during the entire session, if possible. We also may have time if um, audience members want to unmute and state their, their comments verbally. We may have some time to do that um, as well. So to get us started, um, I would like to introduce our excellent panelists. So first we have Dr. Trey Gassandener, a postdoc research fellow in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. He's received his doctorate in clinical psychology from Texas Tech and completed a clinical internship at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. His research and professional interests include understanding mechanisms related to energy intergenerational transmission of trauma and adversity. And he's been supported by grant funding via the NIH Diversity Supplement Program through ECHO. Next, we have Dr. Luis Enrique Maldonado, who is a trained nutritional epidemiologist. His research interests largely focus on dietary, environmental, and psychosocial risk factors of obesity, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and maternal and child health among Hispanics, Latinos in the U.S. and Latin America. He's currently a second year postdoc research scholar at the University of Southern California, working on data from predominantly low-income Hispanic Latina pregnancy cohort in urban Los Angeles, California. And he's also currently supported by an NIH diversity supplement within ECHO. So next we have Dr. Zan Novakowski, who is an associate professor in geriatrics and behavioral sciences and social medicine at the Florida State University College of Medicine. They are a medical sociologist, public health program evaluator and community advocate. Their research, teaching and outreach focus on health equity in aging with chronic disease, they use mixed methods to explore and amplify the experiences of intersectionally marginalized populations to inform effective practice of chronic care for people aging with complex health challenges. And then finally, we have Dr. Michelle White, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics and population health at Duke University. She is an attending pediatric hospitalist and health equity researcher. Dr. White's current work focuses on the impact of neighborhood built and social environmental factors on child obesity and weight related factors. She is a KL2, has a KL2 award focused on community engaged research and developing and testing assets based interventions. Dr. White's also passionate about mentorship and training the next generation of physician scientists. And she currently serves as associate director of the Duke Pediatric Research Scholars Program. So with that, I think we will likely just kind of jump right in. I'm going to stop sharing my intro slides so we can all see our, our excellent panel here. So um, we'll just kind of jump right into questions. So for those of you all who have tuned in to this session um, over the past several weeks, you know that we've had some really great um, conversations on mentorship um, and sponsorship um, and what it really means to be a mentor and, and um, a mentee, uh, as well as sponsoring. Um, so first to start us out off, 
Um, could, e could each of you describe your own personal and academic journeys and how mentorship and sponsorship um, has been beneficial to you? So, um, Dr. Novakowski, would you like to start us off? Sure. So I want to be very clear up front that my journey to where I am now started in my parents' neuroscience research laboratory at University of Mississippi Medical Center and subsequently at Rutgers. Um, it's not an accident that I've been able to break through certain barriers for um, bisexual and non-binary people, chronically ill and disabled people in academia because I wasn't the first in my family on either side. Both my parents have PhDs. Um, my family's sperm donor was also a medical research fellow at U Mississippi Medical Center. So my life got a complex start, but I was literally born as a result of a science experiment. And so I got exposure early and often to the kinds of skills and also the kinds of resources that I was going to need to figure out a way to forge a career um, in health sciences research that was safe for me as a person living with cystic fibrosis where uh, interacting directly in a hospital setting a lot of times very dangerous for us. So my first mentors were my parents and I've really tried to put that energy into everything that I do for my own students, a lot of whom are first gen and who did not have that kind of exposure. Um, my wife is first gen and she was still one of the only out transsex people at FSU during the time we were there uh, when we met. And she was fortunate to have a mentor um, herself who was an, at the time the only out transsex faculty member at FSU. So each of us in our own ways you know, really got that early mentorship that was important for success in our graduate education. We had a very different path to get there because I grew up in that environment. There was nothing that was new for me, even if something was different because of my specific social locations. Thank you for that. I think that's, you know, just a great example of how all of our mentorship and sponsorship journeys are so different. And, um, you know, we, we all, start out in, in much different places and the needs for mentoring and sponsoring um, within academic environments are, are very unique. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Dr. White, would you like to share? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I uh, grew up in a family where academic medicine wasn't really, no one knew anything about it, honestly. Um, uh, I'm the, the first you know, doctor or um, doctoral level person in my in my family. I'm not, however, first generation college, and so I did have the privilege of of having a mom that had had gone to college, um, which not everyone has. Um, so uh, I think you know I've had people sprinkled along the way in my journey that have really um, enabled me to, um, quite frankly, in the beginning, believe in myself. Um, I went from, a, I grew up on a farm in rural Virginia and um, ended up matriculating to Yale. And that was a really huge leap, leap, leap for me um, uh, to go to, from where I'm from to, to that place. And I think my first mentors, really their primary job was keeping me for like moving forward and believing in myself. Um, not every person who's underrepresented in medicine struggles with confidence. I think that's important to state, but I did in the beginning of my journey. Um, and then as I uh, went through medical school and started to, to become a researcher, I had um, one mentor in particular who was really instrumental in listening to me, learning who I was, um, sponsoring me, uh, getting me, uh, you know, uh, giving me opportunities to talk about my research, talking about me, to the big time folks, the well connected folks, helping me get my first job, um, and you know, gently correcting me, and helping me to become a better scientist. Um, so I think kind of the key points for my journey are um, just the importance of both mentorship and sponsorship, the importance of of supporting self belief um, for those who might struggle um, with that, um, and and just kind of continuing to uh, to support like the resilience of of your your mentees who are underrepresented. All right, um, Dr. Gassandiner. Yes, um, I would say 
I think it's sponsorship and mentorship are um, very important and they've been beneficial to me. Um, and I, I probably couldn't say that I would kind of be in the position I am without um, mentorship or sponsorship, um, helping with networking, um, even productivity, kind of the um, output I'm able to um, do. I couldn't have done, I would say, without mentorship, gaining skills, um, certain clinical skills or research skills um, have come from mentorship and those learning experience, experiences and just being able to um, just kind of see what it's like to be in academia and navigate that space. Um, so for me, I think that's been very important for my um, training up to this point. Can you expand a little bit more and talk about kind of your, what's your academic journey been and kind of how to, sure. how to get to where you are now? Yeah, um, I would say much like Dr. White um, and Noah Kowski, my interest in learning began early. Uh, my mom, we read books together. So that was kind of my introduction into just being a bookworm and wanting to explore um, knowledge and gain knowledge. Um, and that really kind of just fostered in me um, just the confidence to be able to, you know, ask questions, um, be able to pose questions in a way that um, lends itself to kind of science and um, getting those questions answered. And I think that's what led me through um, college and ultimately exploring um, graduate school um, to pursue kind of research as, as a career and making an impact that way. Um, when I first got to graduate school, um, I specifically sought out a mentor, um, but after, his, after my first year of graduate school, I ended up transitioning to a different institution. Um, so I really had to start from scratch again with kind of building that mentorship and those relationships. Um, so I think for me, that was a learning experience um, helped me build some resilience and advocating for kind of my goals um, and training needs um, that I think is very important to kind of have when you go into those mentorship or sponsorship relationships, being able to kind of know where you, what you want or where you're heading um, is the best way to advocate for yourself there. Um, so I think those um, all things kind of informed my journey kind of up to this point. Yeah, I think that's a really great point you made about kind of knowing to try to 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 identify mentors because you know we talk about the hidden curriculum of you know coming into these academic spaces and kind of the unwritten rules that are there that are kind of cultural and and passed down. So even knowing to seek out mentors and what mentors and and sponsors or um, relationships are supposed to be like that's that's an something you're not typically taught. Um, so that, that, that's a really excellent point. Um, so Dr. Maldonado, um, would you like to talk about your academic and, and personal journey if it's relevant? Sure, so I, can you hear me clearly? I'm not sure because there's a fan running. Okay. So no, I we can a, hear you. I'm a first generation college student, um, both in college, my master's and PhD, so I did all three. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I obviously didn't have any sort of um, roadmap to college and what, what it meant to apply to college and whatnot. So that was already hard there, right? So then when I got to college, actually, um, what really inspired research for me was the McNair Scholarship Program, which is a, a federally trio funded program. I, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's around anymore, but that really helped me. Um, being part of an affinity group of, of students that identify similarly to me, um, low income status, for example, being first gen, and be interested in research. I think that was really what um, helped motivate me get to where I, where I am now. I'm still interested in research. Um, you know, before college, I didn't even know what research was. I thought it meant being a doctor um, and an MD. So I just, I mean, you know, I think all the, I think all, all that exposure really helped. And I think these kinds of programs really do help. Exposures like, you know, what really could get someone excited about whatever. Like I would, I never thought I would be excited about research until McNair. And, 
And through that program, I actually was able to identify a mentor who actually helped me get my postdoc at USC. So I kind of, you know, 360 there because after USC, I went to get my master's and I'm a PhD and I'm doing my postdoc back at USC. So I went to USC for undergrad too. Um, but anyway, so I think that's been my journey. And, you know, I find myself mentoring here and there because I think it's so essential to try to get, again, I mean, these unspoken rules, right? We don't, you just, you don't really realize how, how much we don't know how to, what to do, or how to proceed, like, um, with certain things in academia. And so you have to be asking around people. And then it's like weird. It's like finding like, um, like, I don't know, like Easter eggs or something, but anyway, so that's, that's my story. That's, that's a neat, uh analogy. Um, I mean, you're, you're totally right. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, and many times it's hard to envision yourself doing things until you see it. And particularly if you see someone that's like you in some way or from the same background as you in some way, it's hard to envision um, yourself. So, you know, for me, um, you know, I'm from a very small town in, in Arkansas. And, um, you know, I knew I wanted to be a physician, but I'd never thought about research um, until I came to my fellowship and was introduced, um, my, my clinical fellowship in allergy, um, and was introduced to research. I had this plan. I was going to go back to Arkansas and open my own practice and read books to kids in my waiting room. And um, until I saw what researchers did and were, were able to do, um, I, I never thought about that um, as a career. So that's a, another really excellent point. Any other comments from the, the panel on that before we move on to the next questions? I just want to echo the importance of having your eyes open by exposure to different experiences and different people. I figured out that I wanted to be a public health program evaluator, uh, both because of a class that I took at Rutgers uh, when I went into that program for my MPH thinking I wanted to be a hospital administrator and uh, maybe administer research. Um, but then also meeting other people who had different experiences of oppression and abuse who were active in the evaluation field and seeing how they were able to translate their experiences into practice. And at the time I was coming out of a previous relationship that was very abusive and you know, sort of reckoning with how that was impacting my journey with my health. And that all really was able to come together because of the exposure that I got in the graduate program. We'll get a little bit more into later about kind of how, you know, our personal identity shapes our mentoring and, and mentorship and, and the sponsoring um, that's most effective because that's something that our, one of our previous speakers um, talked about in um, last week. So we'll we'll get into to that a little bit more because I think that's certainly really important to, to think about. Um, so um, there during this series, we've discussed mentorship and sponsorship and um, some definitions of what they are. So here's just kind of two definitions. Mentorship is a relationship in which a more knowledgeable or experienced person guides and nurtures the professional development or growth of another. And sponsorship has been defined as advocacy and public support of a high potential person or protege by a senior person in power um, as, the, as the sponsor. Um, that's critical for career, career advancement of the protege. So can you talk about in your own words, um, you know, what, what is mentorship and sponsorship to you and how are those, those things um, intersected and, and how are they um, different. So um, I guess we will start back with Dr. White. Yeah, um, so mentorship and sponsorship are both equally important, um, I, I believe, to uh, mentoring underrepresented individuals. Uh, so mentorship for me has been you know, having more senior individuals who are maybe topical mentors. Um, I do child obesity research. So my mentor uh, of the past six years is a prominent child obesity researcher. So she, you know, early, especially earlier in my career, she, you know, helped read, read my papers, reviewed my K award, that kind of thing, and helped to make me better uh, lending her skill set to mine. Um, sponsorship, which this person also did, but others also do, is when is 
you know, giving me the opportunity to, you know, give a talk at, um, uh, at a grand rounds, uh, nominating me for something like that, nominating me for, uh, was, uh, in the Society for Pediatric Research has a, a program for, uh, junior faculty, nominating me for that. So that in that, um, in that program, I was able to meet really high level researchers, the chair at Stanford and another prominent researcher at Cincinnati Children's. Uh, there are, there's empirical data that shows that underrepresented individuals in research, medicine, public health, our social networks are not as broad as our colleagues who are not underrepresented. We do not have the innate connections. Um, and I'm, a, so I'm kind of a social science oriented researcher, so I'm going to speak in those terms, social networks and social capital. We do not have those innate connections and, it, and studies show that that's damaging to us. The, the difference, um, particularly between um, African American and Black researchers and white researchers in their um, grant success at the R01 level, some of that is due to differences in who you know um, and who you're connected to. So the sponsorship is really equally important to just teaching someone how to write a survey or how to write a paper, um, trying to engender those connections so that we have equal opportunities, despite the fact that, you know, my father was not a researcher. My father is not a professor who can call another professor to get me a job. I don't have that. Um, people like me are less likely to have that. So um, that sponsorship is, is really critically important. Thank you. Dr. Novikowski, would you like to comment? Yes, so one thing that's really stood out to me as a mentor and a sponsor is those times when I've been able to meaningfully assess and respond to a need that a student has, even if it's not exactly congruent with my own lived experience, being able to plug in in an actionable way and having that sense of activation to get the work done and to remove barriers for that student and to advocate for them. This is what got started the discussion about closed captioning for the sessions for this series. That's something I always insist on in events that I'm running, uh, try to advocate for accessibility features whenever possible, because this is what I do with my students, whether their accessibility needs are the same as mine or not. I grew up with a blind parent, so, and I saw them adapt, you know, with their lab equipment um, to accommodate their low vision in the technical work that they were doing. Um, and I saw how oftentimes effective mentorship and sponsorship of an up and coming scientist is about thinking about possibilities and figuring out how best to advocate. So when I've worked, for example, with blind students, whether they have no light perception or very low vision, I hear from students a lot that professors didn't wanna work with them because they were blind, that they just dismissed out of hand the idea that this person can practice science. Well, and so I'm asking the question, why? What tasks is the person going to need to do differently? And what solutions do we plug in with to make sure that those tasks are accessible? So you have know, heard from a lot of my colleagues here that for us as mentors and sponsors, who come from different experiences of oppression, we may have very different individual experiences, but we share this fundamental awareness of the importance of a process auditing mindset and a troubleshooting mindset. An effective mentor, effective sponsor in some ways is an engineer of the individual student's experience. An effective mentor or sponsor does that intentionally to anticipate barriers that specific students are going to encounter and to make a plan and implement that plan with each individual student about what it's going to take to address those barriers. And I know that for me, there were many times when my own mentors and sponsors were able to plug in and do that, whether it was with accessibility because of the physical impacts of my CF, uh, whether it was because of me being neurodivergent, which is not uncommon, <laughs> in academia in the slightest, uh, whether it was because of my gender or my sexuality, whether it was because I was an abuse survivor, that I can look back and see times 
where my mentors and sponsors were intentional about supporting me with that troubleshooting and that advocacy. Thank you for that, uh, for those those comments. I think, you know, that kind of, that leads to the, the spirit of, of why we put this webinar together, because, you know, not only are we not taught as faculty that you need to seek out mentors and sponsors, as mentors and sponsors, you're not really taught how to be a mentor or a sponsor. Um, and better yet, we're, we're not, certainly not taught how to mentor and sponsor people from underrepresented um, backgrounds. And so I think one way of doing that is by having these conversations and having people be willing to share, you know, their experiences, share, you know, the pitfalls that have happened so that we can, you know, all, all learn to be better um, at, at what we do. So um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay, um, Dr. Maldonado, I'm not going to leave you last this time. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I'd like to just echo what's already been said, um, but maybe add just one more thing about just, you know, a simple sponsorship can be done just by sending out like opportunities to your mentees. Just like, you know, like this opportunity, this internship is maybe, you, maybe you're interested in it, maybe not. If you're not interested in it, send it around to your friends. I feel like there's a lot of lost chances that people miss because people just don't get to see that opportunity um so you know there's and I, I don't know i mean obviously advertisement is the best way to do that but that's and that's i don't we were not people haven't mastered that yet i feel like being able to send around relevant you know because you don't want to get too many emails either but i think um when it comes to just an opportunity you see that maybe it might be applicable to some, some of the interests of one of your mentees you know, I, I think that's, that, that that should be, um, you should take the extra step to send or forward that email to your mentee. And that's a simple sponsorship. You, you know, you're sponsoring that mentee to apply to this internship because of their um, relevant skills or relevant interests. And so I, I think, um, and that's how, what I think in terms of sponsorship. And of course, like sponsoring someone for like, to, you know, for tenure track position <laughs> as a whole different um, ballgame, but also that, right? um building these support systems and like sponsoring support um affinity groups within departments i think is also important um uh, you know I, I think um I, I think kind of these social hours are really helpful <laughs> in general to getting people to really understand each other and see that you know we're not alone i mean in academia we feel like we're we often feel like we're alone and that we're struggling that we're like not doing our best but that's a common struggle so i think um just, I mean, I get sponsoring not an individual, but sponsoring some of these events. And I'm gonna just, um, I get to take it from that angle. But um, mentorship in general has been great for me. I mean, I think my mentors from USD are still my mentors today. Cause I mean, I'm back at USD now. So I think, um, I mean, I, I still have regular meetings with them talking about like a K99 or is there, you know, like talking about these kinds of grants and they want to help me be successful. And I think that's, um, that's been like a third definition is that I am the pipeline. And so I think that's what's really, um, you know, wonderful about having that kind of support along the way is that it's consistent, right? And it's constant. And I think um, a lot of people get that. I feel that's where, um, that's where our focus should really go in terms of our mentorship and sponsorship for mentees. Dr. Gessen Danner. Yeah, just to um, kind of build off, build off of, just forwarding opportunities, I think um, that can be a really simple thing to do. Um, because for me, a lot of things that I've been forwarded or opportunities that I've um, had have just come from a simple email like that. Um, and a lot of times, um, honestly, I didn't even know where to find those kind of opportunities to begin with. Um, I didn't even know about specific societies or listservs until I went to my first conference and um signed up for a membership so um i think that's important is if mentors or sponsors can just forward those kind of opportunities that come across their emails that maybe their um, mentor or mentee um, aren't even aware of to begin with um, and one thing that i've found helpful uh, for me it's been mentioned um like confidence and kind of what you're doing um just I got an email about an opportunity and my mentor just said, 
um, this seems like a great opportunity. You're well qualified to do it. I think you should apply. And that for me, um, just kind of gave me the confidence of like, yeah, maybe, you know, I can do this, what I'm doing. Um, I'm building these skills for a reason. Um, and I, you know, can be competitive for, um, for these type of opportunities. Um, so I really like that it was mentioned about kind of just simple forwarding of emails uh, can be a, a great help. Yeah, I think that's a that's another really great point of kind of even some of the things that you may consider small, just telling someone, hey, I think you would be great for this. Um, you know, I, I can remember when a mentor of mine told me that I was a good writer, you know, and this was a person that was, you know, had written a lot and, you know, it was well published and they told me I was a good writer and that stuck with me. You know, and so I think sometimes as as mentors, we don't always realize that we need to say those things and give those positive reinforcements um, because, you know, imposter syndrome, whether you like the term or not, it exists and it, it's real. And so even those small things can be a, a huge boost to someone's career. So do any of you have a a mentoring and sponsoring team, you know, they talk about how you need to kind of build this team of, of mentors and sponsors, and you might have this mentor for this area and this peer mentors and lots of different types of mentors. Um, can any of you speak on, do you have a mentoring um, team? Um, Dr. Maldonado, I guess we'll start with you. I would say yes and no. I mean, it's not like it's a committee or anything. Or anything or all <laughs> all um, but I, I, I do talk to um, each one of them about the other. So, like, you know, I'll say, oh, no, you know, uh, Dr. Albrecht, you know, helps me with just being focused. And, you know, Dr. Um, Adair helps me with just venting and understanding um, why I feel the way I feel in academia when it's like really stressful and, you know, like things like that. So, I think. I do have my team. Um, of course, they're really busy. That's another thing. So although I do have my team, it's always um, kind of always hard to really just catch up with them and really, you know, on a regular basis, really under, like uh, break down what's going on in my academic life and when it comes to papers and conferences and whatnot. And so I think, um, yeah, I do. But um, I have like three people. One who I go to, to vent about academia and just like learn more about how to cope with it and like you know tricks on what they've done in their in their academic careers a second one to just talk about professional development and career development and um just strictly that um for the most part and then the third one is just under like well just more it's also career development i guess or just more training like more um more on hands training like grant writing and whatnot so i think um yeah, I do have my team on three um, professors, and they're still, I've had them for the last five years, um, but it's getting a little tough getting, you know, getting, because uh, I'm, I'm also having other mentors at USC, so it's like, you know, I'm just building new relationships there, too, and talking to people there, but um, of course, get, for gaining perspective from different people, from different disciplines, I think is also pretty important, but um, yeah, I would, I would definitely sponsor having um, a support team. Thank you. Um, Dr. Novakowski. So I've never had a formal mentorship team because I never wound up doing um, a K award or a similar type of grant. I work a lot more on contracts from large federal grants, which is very common for professional program evaluators. I actually pay pretty much 100% of my salary by bringing in evaluation subcontracts off of larger grants that I help people get. Um, so in terms of requirements that I have negotiated in my career, I've never had to put together that type of structured mentorship team, but I definitely have my informal team, right? I mean, I think you'll hear that from a lot of folks, you know, regardless of how much socialization we ourselves had with in academia, if we have experiences of oppression, we know who our go-to people are, who are going to support us and who are going to advocate for us, right? Um, and if we have advanced degrees, we probably put together a committee, which is, you know, a type of mentorship team. And I want to talk specifically a little bit about how I put together my committees 
when I was in graduate school, um, because for folks who are kind of at that level right now or who are thinking about how do I engage my committee now that I'm a freshly minted doctor, uh, that question can be really critical for the next steps in your career. So I always tell my graduate students now, you want people on your committee who are going to support and facilitate your development of your program of research. And that is not every professor's attitude, and it may not be the attitude of every professor whose work very closely matches your own topically. And this is always that balance, right, of how much attention do you give to the substantive content of your research, and how much attention do you give to the interpersonal elements of being supported in doing your research? I'm a sociologist, so I freely admit it's maybe my bias, but the interpersonal elements are critical for student success and for students thriving in your programs. I picked my chair for my committee, not because that was the person whose work most closely matched what I was doing. I have those people on the committee as well, but I picked a person as my chair who I knew was very invested in me as a person, who had the power and the status to remove barriers for me, which did come up a couple of times uh, related to accessibility um, and also related to the fact that I was employed full time at the medical school while I was in the grad program in the social department. It was an unusual situation. And who was gonna give me the kind of high level visioning feedback that I needed about narrating my interdisciplinary work and its value. She also knew when to tell me to stop. And this was really key. Anybody who's experienced depression, we know you've often got to work twice as hard to prove half as much. That mentality is incredibly potent and insidious. One of the most important things that my mentor did when I was in graduate school was to help me pace myself not only to give me affirmation about what I was doing well, but also to say that certain things could wait. And my health was declining precipitously while I was in graduate school. So the concept of the future was a, a little bit different for me than it was for a lot of people. And I did rush, I did rush. I, di I did my PhD in two years while working full time. And when people ask me, how did you do it? I tell them I was dying and you will be amazed at what you will do if you think that's all the time you are gonna get. But without that mentor advocating for me and looking out for me, I would have run myself into the ground completely. A good mentor knows how to protect us, not just from our outside oppressors, but also from our own internalized oppression. We're not having that conversation enough in preparing people to be mentors. And that involves continually interrogating our own internalization of ableism, of ethnocentrism, of sexism, of racism, homophobia, transphobia, fatphobia, any phobia or ism you can think of. As mentors, we have to interrogate it and we have to take it apart. As mentees, we have to seek out the people who are doing that work and who are committed to it. Yeah, that is, um, you know, I, we could probably have a whole session where you would talked about like, how did you find this person? How did you know that they were the person that could do that, all of that? Like, how did they become that person? Because what you described is, you know, someone that probably has very unique insights that, um, you know, were able to be the most effective um, for you. And so that's, that's a very unique experience, I think. And also the, the aspect of a, mentor that's able to tell you when to pull it back um because you're right that you know that tax that that we all care carry is 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 very real that extra burden um if you're from a marginalized group to 
feel that you have to overachieve and say yes to everything um, because this opportunity, because you've been given, quote unquote, this uh, this opportunity. Um, so, um, yeah, we could do a whole follow up <laughs> session on that part of it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Dr. White, there was a comment Dr. Novakowski put in the comment about folks that have a K, um, and I know you have a K award and um, formal mentorship team is part of having a, a K award. So can you talk about that or um, your, your mentoring team for your K and just mentoring team overall? So yeah, certainly, but I, I wanna first of all, um, just completely and wholeheartedly endorse all that Dr. Novakowski just shared. Um, and I want to build on that um, a little bit uh, insofar as to say that, you know, I too have mentors that tell me to slow down because, you know, I wanted my first R01 like yesterday and I, you know, didn't even want to really write a K and I have all the things like, you know, my dreams are huge. Like I want to, all the structures that I feel are oppressive around me, I want to change them. And every time I think about like what I want to be, it's like, okay, now I have to run the NIH basically to help change, change that whole structure. So I have to, I have to, to, to get that all done before I retire. Um, but the only way that you know how to relate to your mentee well enough to know when to push and when to tell them to slow down is if you get to know them. And if there's a single message that I want to, my presence on this panel to convey, it's that, you know, not all underrepresented folks are the same. Um, we, you know, whether you have, you know, one black mentee or Hispanic, Latino, LGBTQ, we are just as diverse as can be. And there's intersectionality in the diversity too. So the number one thing that I, and I actually spoke to my mentor before I, you know, got on this panel a couple of weeks ago, I said, what, what would you say? Cause you're really, you know, good at this. And she said, I want to get to know every person that I work with. And I work around that, not who your identity is racially or, you know, who you're married to or anything like, I want to know who you're married to because I want to get to know you. And um, I think that's really, really powerful. Um, not making any assumptions and just really getting to know um, us and who we are. Uh, so my, I mean, I have a formal and informal mentorship team, um, including peers and senior folks. You know, I do have a K awards, so there are formal people there. And, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky, like, I mean, I have people who are both sort of got the name, you know, recognition, because I know that's a thing, but who also have values that I are overlapping with mine. Um, I, and I realize not everybody has that, not everybody's at an institution uh, where you can really choose maybe who your mentor is, because there may be only one person that does that one thing that also has the R1, because that's what ha that's what matters, and that is problematic, um, that that's what matters. Um, but I recognize that that's the way the system currently is. Um, so um, I, my mentors are topical mentors. I have uh, career development people, just wise people that I check in with every um, every quarter um, who, you know, have uh, a good head on their shoulders. Uh, they're not workaholics. They have families. They um, have been through stuff. They have lived some life. <laughs> and I, I, I go through like kind of life stuff with them, too. And, uh, and then just kind of yeah, life mentors, people that are just wise. Like if you're wise, chances are you're gonna get an email from me and be like, hey, can I just like chat with you about this, this opportunity? Um, so I'm very careful with telling who is in what job and like making sure we're really clear on expectations. I think that's really important. Um, but that that's kind of how I've, I've run my career uh, to date. Thank you. Dr. Gessendaner, do you have any other comments to add? I'm not a whole lot. That's been well said so far, um, to be honest with you. Um, but as far as kind of my team, it's it evolved, I would say, kind of as I progressed through my training. Um, and it kind of depended on sort of what kind of experiences or um, training or clinical skills I wanted to um, kind of learn or acquire. Um, so for example, my primor, primary mentor in graduate school 
um, is a statistics and methodology expert and an adult substance use researcher. Um, and I primarily focused on children and childhood trauma. Um, so there was kind of a disconnect between our interests, but I wanted to learn stats and methodology and get those expertise. Um, so I approached, approached him just with that expectation just to learn about stats and methods. Um, and that was a good fit because um, he told me, you know, data is data. It doesn't matter if it's substance use or trauma. Um, so um, he was able to, you know, provide me the resources, textbooks, um, just impromptu meetings in his office about how to do a specific approach to a certain um, type of question. Um, and then I also had another mentor who was kind of more in the childhood trauma um, field that I could meet with just to bounce off ideas, talk about kind of the state of the literature, things like that. Um, so I think for me, it my team kind of evolved around kind of what I was needing at that time or whatever specific interest um, that I had. Um, and I was able to carry that kind of throughout internship and now postdoc. Um, so now that for me, you kind of built kind of this mini network that I can kind of reach out to for certain things. Um, so I guess that's what's been helpful for me. Thank you. All right, so we've kind of touched on before, um, well, we've actually touched on, I think a lot about identity and how our identity and mentors and sponsors identities intersect in, in that relationship. We had a speaker last week who talked about how when she goes into mentor-mentee relationships, she, she thinks about her own identity as a woman and as a caretaker and the person that she's mentoring, how that may intersect with um, their identity and the, maybe the blind spots that she may um, have there. So um, how do you all think um, personal identity impacts mentor and mentee relationships? And um, do you think menti mentors should think about their identity um, when going into mentor relationships? So for this one, I'll just kind of throw it out there. Um, whoever wants to answer that first can unmute. It's an ongoing journey, like what, so speaking as a mentor, um, it's an ongoing journey, blind spots that I have. It is extremely humbling. I think it is helpful to reflect um, on your identity in terms of like, you know, because that basically, you know, my identity is a product of my exposure and I've been exposed to certain things, but, you know, because of where I grew up, I wasn't exposed to other, other individuals, other um, uh, cultures. And so um, I think just continually reflecting on who you who you don't interact with, um, what makes you feel uncomfortable? Because that's kind of maybe the first indication that there might be some bias that's likely to happen in that encounter. Um, why did that individual make you feel uncomfortable? Why did that phrase make you feel uncomfortable? And I think that requires some self-reflection. Might require talking to a peer. Might require talking to a therapist. I'm a huge fan of mental health and like getting um, therapy. Um, uh, so I think, um, and one example of this, I'll just kind of give a concrete example, you know, uh, I was recently on a search committee and, you know, basically there was a, a an individual in the search committee, uh, a candidate, it was being talked about as a lesser candidate because of where they went to school. And, um, I, uh, I didn't realize, I, I knew as academically that, that that was a way that bias occurs, but that's not a type of bias that I typically am um, vulnerable to because I've had the privilege of getting my degrees from institutions that are considered the quote of the name brand institutions. But it really opened my eyes to the fact that, I, you know, that might be a bias of mine, either because I'm blind or because I'm more likely to go with candidates that are from Ivy League or whatever institutions. And then number two, in order for me to advocate for equity that people would look at that candidate properly, it was going to require tearing down a bit of what holds me up. 
uh, because I get elevated because I have the damn brands and I'm going to have to tear down that system a bit in order or completely in order to really elevate someone else. Um, so I hope that's kind of a helpful illustration to how identity um, kind of influences your mentorship and, and kind of your advocacy. So I'll jump right in and just say I love the explicit attention and really echo that attention to getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. What I teach the folks I work with at any level especially those who are going to become doctors, is that the most important thing you can do in your career is lean into those moments of discomfort as moments of your greatest opportunity. Those are the moments where if you rise to the demands of the moment, you can make meaningful change. And it's very liberating, I will say, even for folks who are very senior in the game, to realize that they don't have to be perfect, they just have to be willing. A lot of us got socialized to believe that either you got it or you didn't. And either you were just already comfortable and totally conversant in something, or you might as well not try. That's toxic. That's that heteropatriarchal capitalist nonsense that keeps us fighting each other rather than turning around and fighting the oppressors. All you've got to do is be willing and show up and try, try, try. That is the first thing that students hear from me, for example, when they are getting intensive mentoring on taking care of trans and intersex patients. Guess what? You don't have to know all the vocabulary. I'm trans. I don't know all the vocabulary. I learned the word intersex when I was already a professor. It's not about perfection. It's about effort and it's about opening yourself to those opportunities. So just that learning to let go, that's again, that is so critical. And we forget sometimes that mentors have imposter syndrome too. It gets its hooks in there in these really insidious ways. So getting those opportunities to relax, take a step back and say, no, we don't have to know everything. We don't have to be perfect. We can get comfortable being uncomfortable and we can get comfortable being imperfect. It seems daunting at first, but it's, it's very freeing and it's transformation. That's a really excellent comment. Um, you know, I think it's really great for, for mentors to, to hear that, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, reaching out and mentoring underrepresented and marginalized students and, and faculty members, because um, there is that perfectionism that's built into to academia where you feel like, you know, I, I can't mentor this student because I don't know everything about their their background, but that's that's not true, you know, um, and being willing to, to be uncomfortable. Um, so we do have someone with their hand up. I'd like to, would you like to unmute? I, well, first of all, I want to thank um, the, the panel. That this has been really helpful. Um, I, I listened to a panel last year where students were talking about this, um, and as a kind of cis het white male, um, I uh, the, I was trying to take tenants about thinking about um, how to be a better mentor to individuals who aren't uh, as represented in science, and it kind of the, the way they talk, and I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but not very far, um, was essentially two tenants. Don't be a jerk and help your people find their people, uh, you know, affinity groups. And I'm hearing, and please correct me, because uh, I'm hearing a third tenant, which is um, do the work, you know, be intentional about it, do the work. Um, and maybe that's a little more work for um, for me to do if I'm um, mentoring a, a, a Black woman. Um, I have to be a little more thoughtful about that. So is that, are there other tenants that I can be thinking of as I'm, as I'm building these relationships? Um, uh, or, or does that, do those three sound pretty, pretty good so, so far as I, as I continue my mentorship journey? I, I, I think I would just add, not just connecting the individual with their people, but connecting them with the people who are in power as well. <laughs> um, so, you know, making uh, my mentor told me directly that she actually tries to introduce her underrepresented um, mentees to chairs and pr presidents of different things and the journal editor even more so than 
her non underrepresented mentees. So I just want to add that. Also, I would add, ask your mentees what they want and need from you. Get the instructions from them. And then this is the critical part. Follow the instructions. This is great. Um, so I think that is probably an excellent note to, to leave this on with what the five tenets that we um, came up with. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for joining today. Our panel, do you have any last very quick comments? Okay, do we cover as much as we could, sounds like. So um, with that, thank you all so much for, for joining us. I hope everyone found this conversation as helpful um, as I did. So everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you.